I see Linda drinking her coffee. All right, I think I'm going to share my screen and we can get going. Does that sound good with you, Barbara? Yes, let me just uh, grab something real quick. Just a tinge of a tension headache. Need to get outside. Okay. All right. Well, hi everyone. Welcome to Miami Beach Botanical Second Saturday Seminar. My name is Sunno Sullivan, and I'm the head gardener here. I'm really excited to be here this morning to talk about native plants and what we can do to protect Biscayne Bay. Thank you all for being here and realizing that the health of the bay is in decline. The good news is, is there are many things we can do to protect the water quality and the wildlife that depend on this amazing South Florida ecosystem. In this presentation about buffer zone plantings and plants, we'll learn just that. Here at the garden, we're big fans of native plants and the wildlife that they attract. Our newly planted Collins Canal Garden is a great example of a sustainable plant palette along a waterway here in Miami Beach. The daily sight of butterflies and birds that are attracted to this garden, along with knowing we're not polluting the bay, makes us really happy. I know our presenter, Barbara McAdam, shares some of the same sentiments as we do. We're always happy to partner with Barbara and the UF IFIS Extension Miami-Dade County Office. Barbara is their Urban Horticultural Program Specialist. She has been there since 2005. After she completed her Master Gardeners Program through them, she really realized the importance of their Florida-friendly landscaping program. That includes sound gardening practices that not only help save water, but protect our water resources. She's made a huge difference in teaching the public environmental stewardship, everything from her own habitat restoration efforts and creating pollinator gardens to her famous rain barrel workshops. <laughs> a native of South Florida, Barbara is an inspiration to all of us for her pure love of nature and fascination of the creatures and plants we get to share this planet with. So thank you very much, Barbara, for being here and all of you. Her presentation will go on till about 11 a.m. and then we'll have about 15 minutes for questions and answers. Feel free to put your questions in the chat. I'll try to keep up with them or save them to the end. Thank you all very much again and take it away, Barbara. Okay, so I can share my screen. Yep. Uh, it's saying that it's disabled. So um, let me try it again. Oh. Nope. I just Still need... disabled. And you need to stop screen sharing. Yep. So I can share. So You're... tell me when you can try it again. You're a co-host now. You should be able to. Yay, co-host. And thank you for all those kind words. And hopefully I do. I have been making an impact. That's what I'm that's, that's our mission, our entire team with uh, Florida Yards and Neighborhoods, Florida Friendly Landscaping. So this background photo here almost uh, was the postcard that we created for all of our social media. And it's called Salty Urbanism. And it actually, you're gonna see it a little bit later on because it goes through a project that um, Fort Lauderdale is working on right now. So once again, here's my um, contact information and you'll see it again at the end of the presentation. So no worries. And if we don't get to your questions, you have my email. You can, you can send me an email. I probably will answer it on Monday. <laughs> 
So here we go. I got the opportunity for the first time this year to attend the Water Institute Symposium up in Gainesville at the University of Florida. As a matter of fact, that's me right there. I'm going to get rid of, I'm going to hide my thumbnails because they're always in the wrong place. That's me and that's at the uh, peer-reviewed uh, posters um, at, which happened in the evening at, of the event. And what would you know? Water Institute focuses on water in all of its uh, phases and how we, you know, surrounds us and how we use it here in South Florida. But this year was about the die off of seagrass, blue green algae, red tide. We have, it's not just UF focused, we have speakers from many, many areas of the country and also internationally. What you can see here, we have uh, opening remarks from um, Brian Brooks from Baylor and Dr. Hans Perel. And I have a link here. You're going to get a PDF with all of these links if you want to listen to um, the presentations. And I also have downloads of the PDFs from presentations. But you can see blue-green algae here. And I think we all remember the events of uh, several years ago off of Loxahatchee in that area uh, from runoff coming into that area from Lake Okeechobee and from um, septic tank leakage as well. We did not and do not have blue-green algae in Biscayne Bay. Many of the causes are the same and the solutions are the same. So this was very apropos that I got to attend this. So just to give you an idea, these algal growths are breaking out everywhere all across the planet and it is in fresh water and salt water. And just a few months later, I wake up one morning and I'm hearing all of this talk about what's happening with dead fish in Biscayne Bay. And this is from the Pelican Harbor Seabird Rescue. Good friends, Christopher Boykin and Kiki Mutis shot this video of the stingrays and the puffer fish coming up close trying to, to get oxygen. And the bay just, just suffered from an extreme lack of oxygen. It was extremely hot. And we did have some runoff events. We had some big rain events. So you can watch this link and look at the video and just hear Christopher getting kind of terrified at what's happening at what he's seeing. And I've known both of these uh, folks for a long, long time, for at least as long as I've been at the Extension Office, 2005. So before that, we had the unified approach to recovery for a healthy bay and resilient Biscayne Bay, for a healthy and resilient Biscayne Bay. Task Force made its rec uh, recommendations in June 2020, and this is available for you to download. I have downloaded it onto my computer and started making notes on it. Um, and it covers a lot of the things as, as suggestions, as more than suggestions, I would say, but um, highlighting what we can do. And of course, there are many areas and many, many issues. There's going to need to be some construction. There's going to need to be some code changes. Um, you know, septic to, to sewer line connections, but what we can sort of the, the soft side of that without huge construction, and I like to call it the low hanging fruit, is what we can all start to do in our own backyards, no matter where we live. So that is highlighted in this report as well. And it's been said that yeah, we've heard all of this before, and you have, because scientists have been talking about what is happening and how we can work to prevent these things from happening for a long time. So now we've reached that tipping point where we're seeing dead fish floating and we have um, E. coli in the water samples still that are be being taken. You can find that information on um, Oh my goodness, Waterkeeper's website. I signed up to get everybody's newsletter, surf writers, all of the people that are involved in this. So 
clearly, truly, everyone is part of the solution. It's our bay, it's our economy, it's our playground. For many of us, I grew up uh, sailing on the bay, racing sailboats, and just having a blast in my 20s and early 30s. I love the bay. I love all water. Um, and it's incumbent upon us to each do everything that we can. So just a quick, what is Florida friendly landscaping? This should be the number one place that you take a look. You go to it on our website. It's on our webpage. You're going to see how to get this. This entire program began in the mid 90s because we were seeing data that supported or showed that 90 or I'm sorry, 60% of non, I, I flipped that in my head, 60% of non-point source pollution was coming from what homeowners are doing in their yards, front yard and backyard. And we're just using way too much fertilizers and pesticides and we're using way too much water. We've, we've been led to believe that we need to do all of this to have a healthy, beautiful landscape. And by the way, grass doesn't stay that perfect shade of green all year. So why? Because the days get shorter and, and needs sunlight. But this program is just full of many, many, many uh, initiatives and advice and guidelines for how you can create a and beautiful, thriving, wildlife-friendly, Florida-friendly landscape and help conserve and protect all of our water bodies. It goes through nine principles. I'm not going to go through each one of them, but the cornerstone is right plant, right place. And yes, you'll see a butterfly back there because I am very, very involved in pollinator protection and creating pollinator gardens, aka butterfly gardens. And that would be principle number five, attract wildlife. So when you read through this, and I encourage you, it's just a little bit of homework, go ahead and go through all nine principles. Because right now, we have fertilizer regulations being put into place. And the guidelines are already there. And other tips besides, you know, telling you that you're not allowed, when you're not allowed to, and when you are allowed to apply fertilizer, are in this publication. So please read up and follow through and learn how to garden friendly. Protect the waterfront is principle number nine. That's just a huge resource. And we'll just bring you to a better understanding of how we all, even if we're way inland like I am, the fruit and spice park, what we do in our landscapes, we're all protecting the waterfront always. So this just goes through, again, this is copied and pasted right from the publication. And we talk about your maintenance-free zone as 10 feet. And I believe now they are, are looking at doing uh, 15 feet. So that, you know, whether they expand it to 15, it should be at least a minimum of 10 feet. And uh, Santa, I love that undulating line of the sidewalk. Um, I'm not a straight line person, so that did it for me. Um, and then I'm sure you had at least 15 feet there or at least 10 feet. I love the plant selection too. So typically shoreline vegetation would be what we would have found here if we were the first explorers. No seawalls, um, the land would have sloped gently down to the edge of the bay. And before we got to that water, we might have had to wade through mangroves and a whole other upland plants that are close to the edge of that water, all adapted for that environment. So what we're gonna talk about today is how can we put some of this back so that it is the buffer zone that catches anything before it runs into the bay. And you folks living on the bay, lucky you guys, um, you're the, the last uh, front of, of the, before it falls right into the bay, but all of us are gonna be following and, and adopting these friendly practices. And 
you know what, especially, they even talk about this in one of the, um, one of the many meetings that uh, they've held on, on the state of Biscayne Bay is the grass clippings. You now I, I just grab those up and let them compost. And they do a great job of composting over there at Miami Beach Botanical. Next time I visit and drop off plants, I'm gonna grab some. So, let's see if my slide will advance. <laughs> Oops, maybe it thinks you guys are all reading this. <laughs> there you go. Here's a photo, and I'm, I'm gonna go a little quickly through this first part, because I've been looking at this for a long time, and what we're, what we're gonna be doing and, and thinking and planning about doing is already being done. It's already in play all around the United States, in the state of Florida, and around the world. This is Toronto's solution. This is a rendering of how they can soften that edge and create that barrier. The plants that will help filter off any of the pollutants and high nutrient before it finds its way into that bay. And riprap, instead of it's, you'll see a lot about the problems with seawalls. And I will say this, we'll, I'll do another presentation about how to uh, create a living shoreline and also what we can do with existing seawalls because if you were to jump in a boat today and just travel up one side of the bay and then down the other side both the western edge of Miami and the eastern side which is the beach communities you would see that we're very much walled in along the bay everyone has built a seawall so what we do about this now still is in, in study. It may not be that we can remove these and how would we slope the, the land gently down? We have a pretty steep drop off now with people who have built a seawall and built up the land behind it and then built their homes and created their gardens on top of it. So this is New York City's Domino Parks. This is one of the uh, solutions they came up with. And there still are areas besides all of the, the residential areas where we can do this type of thing. And I don't wanna point anyone out, but there's a, a golf course on, on the beach side that um, just is bordered on, on a good 50% of its border is slopes right into the bay and slopes right in with grass. So this could be something that a property or a community like that could adapt to. So it's all gonna hinge around when we look at this, what are the right plants that we need to plant along the shoreline? We can look at everybody else's plants as far as how they built it and designed it and need to study the flows and the tides and things for our Biscayne Bay, and we can adapt them, but we need to really, really have our own plant list because that is going to be unique even here in Miami-Dade County. If you went a little further north to Broward or Palm Beach, that plant list is going to change ever so slightly, and we need to select the plants that are going to perform and will be able to stand the environmental conditions they'll be placed in. So one more look, a couple of more looks. I'm fascinated with China's sponge cities also. Uh, here's a China sponge city. Makes a, they make beautiful parks when you create these areas. So, and I love this architectural model from a, a dumping area to a beautiful project. So you'll see this, um, salt, this is salty urbanism again, and you're gonna get this link. This was a study that was done for a community in Fort Lauderdale. And that's what you saw in the opening of this slide. And they put together a plant palette. Now, I like their plant palette. Um, I, I think most of them are good. Go ahead and have a look at this as well. And we're in, we're in sync pretty much. They used a lot of natives, which are gonna be salt tolerant. And I'm gonna show you a couple of my favorites. So 
again, no matter where you are, let's make sure that you're following your homeowner association, your community is following Florida Friendly Landscapes. Just some things for you to think about. And we know we have been dealing with water here in South Florida. We get a tremendous amount of rain each year and a lot of it comes at one time and we have to give that water somewhere to go. Somewhere to go where it can sit and then slowly percolate through the soil and recharge the aquifer. If everything is a hard surface, then we have more and more stormwater runoff and that is going to find its way into the bay. Well, this is also from the salty urbanism. This is a flooded street and this is a sunny day flooding and we're all experiencing that. So another thing you'll see is from NOAA, living shorelines. This is where everybody is looking at information. NOAA has had this as a solution and we are looking at natural solutions to handle the issues with Biscayne Bay. I'll walk you through and this exists inland even well not quite where I live this is still a waterfront it's a canal but yes it's a waterfront and that must be extremely difficult to mow <laughs> down to that edge sorry but um, I, I mean you could have just a pathway of green and I guess the doggies need to use that so you know they would still be able to use it you know we always tell people think about what you need that lawn area for and then design around it so that could be a beautiful edge there so sea grant is part of uf and they have been doing the living shorelines they have uh, a whole publication on it and a website um uh, pages on their website devoted to this. And Anna, sorry, that's not a best picture of Anna. I asked her to send me a better one, but she didn't. So there, um, sorry, Anna. And Heather is good friends with Anna and has done the natural, nas master naturalist courses where they have um, created the living seawalls using old oyster shells. And there's also, talk of repopulating the oysters so that they can grow again and that will help break the the waters the storm water coming in it'll break it up and it will help with nutrient uptake now the links here are to her blogs she is a prolific writer and her blogs all resolve around life on the water check it out and particularly her, her Biscayne Bay uh, fish kills updates. She's going to give you a little more detail on the science of what the algal bloom was that broke out. And that is still being studied to identify all of the issues and, and um, that contributed to that. And it's only just in the background. This is not going to go away it's going to continue unless we make some changes in, in what we do. It will come again when we have those same conditions. So I just took a little look. Remember I told you that most of the bay is walled in. This is, um, I used to walk to this, this little spot in Davis Harbor, just north of Miami Shores. You guys from Miami Shores. I lived in a house to the left of this photo on a corner. And you can actually see some, some trash there. And right in front of the house where I used to live, there's an overflowing um, garbage bin. And this is going over Broad Causeway, seawall, seawall, seawall. As a matter of fact, everywhere I put my cursor, I saw seawall both uh, on both sides of the bay. And this is that golf course in the background there. So you can do a little walk through Google or Microsoft Edge on satellite view, or you can jump in a boat and take a ride and, and see for yourselves. This almost was the, um, again, this is my second choice for creating the, um, 
the media, the postcards for our social media. And this is Broad Causeway. And here you have a seawall and here you have some riffraff. And what do you have just right there at the edge? Green grass, and it is irrigated. So this is where you would wanna add those plants. It may not be to scale, but this is the type of situation where you can do that in an area that's non-residential. So I'm gonna take you to the resource that we wanna use. And we're at slide, almost slide 30 something. And we're finally gonna dig into the plants. This is a resource that I use constantly as do other scientists. We all joke about it. I live on their website. At least I'm there pulling up some information four to five times a day. And I decided, hey, I need to donate because I'm like, you know, I, I live and breathe off of their website. It's so convenient. I mean, I have tons of books on native plants and I have our UF publications. But when I wanna really look at something, all of that information is there. So this encompasses 10 counties at this time. I think it's 10, um, you guys can count them. And it has a function where you can pull up what plants would be native to your location using your zip code. Now, what's your zip code? Or if you're planning and working on a project what is the zip code for that project area? You can go to unitedstateszipcodes.org. And for instance, if you lived in Bay Harbor, you would know your zip code. But if I were looking at this here and we were looking at what are we going to design to prevent this stormwater runoff and nutrients, then I might not know the zip code for that area. Maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. But you can investigate this. And you can also do some exploring and look at what's found all along the coastal, the coastline of uh, Biscayne Bay. So how you use this next, you entered in, you have a couple of options. You can use the zip code. I'm often on the plant site, putting in a specific plant and you can pull up a list of plants for your zip code. And I use 33181. If we go back, this was 33181. And this is one of the areas that's identified as having um, quite a bit of nutrients coming off. That's in the, the report, by the way. It has a map of the areas that have the most nutrient runoff that are, were contributing. And this, this problem with dead fish was primarily in the upper north part of the bay. So you can also look at habitats. And that's very helpful as well. And I'll, I'm going to show you how, but one of my favorite features is they've added wildlife. And where did they start with wildlife? They're in the process of uh, just getting more and more data entered on this. When they began, they only had information for three counties. They are working towards having this information for the entire state of Florida. So wildlife right now is going to give you a butterfly list. No, no problem with me. And for my zip code, I have 33031. I have all but one butterfly that's on that list and I have more. And they also link you back to other resources and it's UF and butterflies and moths of North America. And maybe we need to get them to add our local Miami blue chapter because we have a list of every butterfly and its larval host plant that is found in, in Miami-Dade County. So always planting for the pollinators, that's food. So think of it that way. Now, when you look at habitats, these are all coastal type habitats. And it would be a good idea to look at the descriptions and kind of have a look through the plant list. Let me show you what you get when you, when you pull up the plant list. And this is just a small section of the plant list, but they've started including just a little screenshot so that you can have a, have a little bit of an idea of what it is and you can sort it by scientific name or by common name. A lot of you are not gonna know the scientific name, but let me just point out that 
Common names are fine, are great, but when you're specifying or, or when you're going to purchase plants, use the scientific name. That ensures that you are going to get the exact plant that you're looking for because common names are common. Um, there are many plants share common names. And, you know, if you say, um, oh, let's, um, Chryso, um, <laughs> I'm, the, I'm Psychotia nervosa. That's going to ensure that you get the shiny leaved wild coffee rather than the short leaved wild coffee. Or if you just say, hey, I need wild coffee, who knows what you would get. So I think you've got the picture there and the understanding of just, just use the scientific names. Now, this is just a small portion of the plant list. I, I went to, and I'm gonna show you just some of the shrubs and woody ground covers. But I'll tell you another trick with this. Let me just go back for a second. Something that, that I kind of discovered yesterday. Right here, at this stage, when you go to online resources and the menu drops down and um, you select um, this, this area, yesterday I put in plant. I just clicked on plant and I, I, I was in a hurry. So I just put C, S, E, A and hit search. That came up with an incredible list of plants that are suitable for saltwater environment. So I'm gonna add that to my recommendations of, of how you can use this, this incredible database. So without further ado, let's jump in. This is one of my favorites, um, actually over at the Pelican Harbor um, Seabird Rescue, that whole area over there, they've planted beach creeper. You could definitely plant this in that 15 or 10 foot area, which, which is no mow before you hit the seawall or the paved area leading to the seawall. And I've highlighted some of the in information that you'll find when you click further on that IRC website. So you can even print these or you can bookmark them or you can copy and paste and start working on your list. This is a beautiful little a flower on here and it provides food and nectar for pollinators, provides food for birds. And pay attention here because we wanna know if it's saltwater tolerant because we're gonna use it next to the bay. And is it salt wind tolerant? Now, because we're not expecting it to flood very often, it's not, but it's okay. It is a seaside plant, but it may be further inland. The thing is that it will not tolerate long-term flooding by salt or brackish water, but it will tolerate some and it will most likely recover quicker than your non-native species that may not be as adapted here. And again, it's secondary line. It would grow a little more inland. So it is somewhat um, tolerant of salt wind spray. And we have both of those and plants have different, sometimes you can have a plant that is very, very salt wind tolerant, but cannot tolerate any salt water uh, flooding. It cannot stand sitting in salt water. So there's not, there's very few plants if we limit ourselves to something that's high in both of these categories, we're only gonna have a handful of plants. What we wanna select is the ones that are most likely to survive. And also the fact that they are I'm looking at, I'm showing you natives here, they're gonna help provide for wildlife, life along the shore while you're protecting life in the bay. This is one of my favorites and you cannot grow this inland. It gets all sorts of diseases and just doesn't, doesn't do well. Um, I had it in my yard in Miami Springs and, and sure enough, it never really grew very large and it sort of went into decline. Now here's a bonus, it's a larval host, meaning that this butterfly will lay its eggs. You won't see very much damage as the caterpillars kind of eat the leaves, that's what a, a larval host is. But it's an, also a nectar plant 
for a whole bunch of butterflies that you would find in that shoreline um, environment. And I've provided hyperlinks there so you guys can explore for further information. This is one of the plants that we're donating to Miami Beach Botanical Garden. We have about 50 of these that were grown by, um, I think it's Urban Paradise, Sam Van Leer. He donated these to us as little seedlings and we've nurtured them and now they're about, mm, they're about 12 to 15 to 18 inches tall. These are gonna become trees or a large shrub. You'll see this growing at Deering Estate and it's a great shoreline plant. Again, it says low, so it doesn't wanna get inundated for very long, but it is moderate. It will tolerate salt wind. And what is not on the Institute for Regional Conservation's website is at Miami Blue, we identify it as a larval host for the beautiful Florida um, purple wing and, and the dingy purple wing. And both of those have been found at Deering Estate. Another great plant. This one just provides so much food. The birds are gonna come and eat the berries and it provides cover. You know, where do, where do all those critters go on, you know, on rainy days like we've had for over a week? They hang out in these shrubs and, and fold their wings and just wait for better weather. So it'll also attract speak moths and a, and a host of other um, pollinators. And right now when we talk about birds, we're a fly over here and we have many, many beautiful migratory birds that are just visiting or may stay and spend the winter in your yard. I have painted buntings now for about five years in a row and hummingbirds for over 20 years will, will overwinter in my yard. So I'm not gonna explain every single plant. The links are here and this is designed so that you know the resources and you begin to explore more. I'm just showing you a couple of my favorites. I love those like purple flowers and the bright red berries on this. And unlike a lot of databases that just list plants that you would find, this actually to, um, advises what horticultural conditions it likes. Full sun, it is drought tolerant, et cetera. Where would you normally find this? Growth rate, which is important. And how large is it actually going to be once it's mature? And that's very important that we know that because we typically do not allow the space for mature plants. We certainly don't think of that when we're planting trees. And that is why you see so much failure with where trees are planted and installed. So this one is also, the fruit is edible. A lot of people make jellies and jams out of this and you can develop a, a taste for them. I just love to pick them and eat them just the way they are. And definitely the birds will grab these when they're starting to get ripe and just fly off and take them and start, they break it open with their beaks and start to, to eat um, the juice and juicy fruit in there. Again, a moderate salt wind tolerance. Now, this was actually the first um, choice for doing the social media campaign because I love the fact that elderberry, this is an underutilized plant down here, that you can make wine from elderberry. You can buy elderberry wine and I thought, hey, it would be great if we could all, if we had done this in the evening, we could all have toasted each other with elderberry wine. Leave that thought for another time. This is significant cover because it's small leaved and it's dense. So it provides cover for wildlife and birds are gonna love those fruits. And of course they're edible. So this is wet thickets, swamp margins, where you can find those plants. You can go to our Florida chapter our Dade Chapter of Florida Native Plant Society. I forgot to share that with you and I will send it over. And they have a list of plants that sell native plant nurseries. We're missing those events this year like Native Plant Day and the Audubon uh, plant sale that they hold once or twice a year. So 
and we probably won't have Fairchild Ramble next year, I hope. Beautyberry, aptly named American Beautyberry. And this grows in a wide range of habitats and types. And most people don't realize that it is fairly salt wind tolerant and it will grow in that It'll grow, I would put this to the back of the 15 foot zone if you're going to go there. And some of these plants that grow a little taller, put them to the sides, put your lower growing plants in the center so you'll still have that view of the bay. And this is an incredible wildlife um, attractor. Mockingbirds will get territorial over this. Painted buntings, which are living at my, at, in my yard now, also love these berries, but the mockingbirds kind of chase everybody off. And those flowers are nectar for all of the pollinators and very pretty. St. John's wort, how could we forget this one? Ha uh ha. -huh. Um, this is a great coastal plant and maybe a little more difficult to find, but I want to say one thing that demand should drive supply that's where economy should work. When you keep asking for it, hey, do you have St. John's? Do you have Hypericulum brachyphyllum, the, the Florida native St. John's wort? You know, ask for it enough times and get your friends to ask for it. They're going to start to get the message that, hey, we, maybe we need to grow this. And we know several nurseries down here in the homestead area that I live in that will contract grow different plants if you request it well enough in advance. So if you're going to do a restoration project, or you're going to do a big project at your house, um, they may not grow it just for your house, but you know, you may just say, hey, my neighbors are interested in this as well. This is a beautiful little plant. It's sort of purplish, um, coastal plain stagger bush, and it looks like little lilies of the valleys. Now that's kind of a rough uh, texture on the leaves and it provides food and moderate amounts. You can see it's a little more open um, for wildlife, but it is highly attractive to all of our, both our native and our European bees. And it's just a really interesting uh, plant. It has sort of that silvery gray and I like the way the leaves poke out through the flowers. Beautiful, beautiful plant. Um, I've only seen this growing in the wild when I visited, I was working on the island of Antigua in my previous life, and this is just a spectacular, stunning plant. And it is um, low on both salt water tolerance and salt wind, but can be again at that back of your, your border or maybe bordering the sides of your property and you don't have to put it that close to the edge near the where it would get salt spray. And keep in mind that an event like Andrew or a more direct hit from Irma, uh, all bets are off. We're going to have damage no matter what you plant, but how quickly will things recover? And I think the natives will, will be able to come back. And I have visited many islands and lived through Hurricane Andrew here as well. Things will come back. So why it's a beautiful plant, but it's also, it's also a nectar source for all of these butterflies. So all of those tiny little white flowers, and again, it's an amazing thing, how the smallest of flowers can have the sweetest of nectar that everything just is attracted to. And uh, milkberry. This is a plant you'll see a lot growing down in the Keys. You don't have to drive too far and you'll find this and you'll even see this uh, in more natural areas down here in Homestead Redland area. And you can bring it into your landscape at home. It's high salt wind tolerant. And um, I can't remember the name of the park, oh, sorry. Um, but I've, I've seen it, observed it growing in, in a park setting in the Keys and it's just been, oh my goodness. So that's what that looks like. That is beautiful. It's uh, nectar 
and it's also I don't know why that keeps popping up it's uh, nectar for Julia and other butterflies and it's perhaps maybe they highlighted the Julia because you'll see this butterfly in abundance around this plant some butterflies of course most of them are um, limited to using just a handful of plants as their larval host, and some definitely have preferences in what plants they use for nectar. This one doesn't do well in more inland areas because it gets tip dieback, but um, the coral bean or Cherokee bean does do better when it's more, when it's closer to the coast, and maybe it is that salt air environment that helps keep the moth that lays its egg on this and causes the tip die back on this. And this plant also can get a little gnarly looking. It'll kind of drop its leaves uh, at certain times of the year. But if you do get this to grow well, and I would plant them maybe close to each other or plant something else to kind of camouflage it if it gets, you know, that kind of skinny look to it like we do with our milkweed, right? We know that it's going to get stripped with leaf, uh, of all its leaves. But this is hummingbird magnet par excellence and is very high in salt wind tolerance. Florida privet, great plant for these environments, high salt wind tolerance and significant, just a great nectar source, beautiful little flower on there. You know, a lot of these are not showy when they're in bloom, but when you get right down up close to them, they're incredibly beautiful. And a very much a favorite. And this photo is from one of our parks. Sorry, Rogers, Roger Hammer took this photo and his name moved out of place. Um, this is our native. It's often confused with non-native, and it is high salt wind tolerance, so it can go. You'll see this growing along the coast in our, in our parks at Border Bis Biscayne Bay. And uh, Deering Estate, uh, I can't, uh, sorry, I'm not fluent with the parks just flowing off the top of my head. I should have brought up the map, but um, this, is a, this is very fragrant. And it produces, uh, it produces berries and the birds just love this. And the fragrance is gonna pull in all of the pollinators. When it says bee pollinators, that means all of our native bees and those types of pollinators. Make sure you get the native for that. And the key is in using the scientific name again. Uh, Santa, how am I doing for time? Do I need to speed it up? You've got about 10 minutes till 11. Yeah, I knew I was talking too slow uh, because I'm having too much fun. Um, go for Apple. If you guys find this, please let me know. I really want to add this. This is a great plant for those, those edges and it produces an edible fruit that's highly attractive to wildlife. Notice it says go for Apple. Gopher turtles love this fruit and so does everything else. Now I don't, you're gonna get gopher turtles um, on your property and you may not want them, but um, this is just a beautiful, fragrant white flower again, and it's edible fruit. You could, I'm sure you could play when doing something in that. And all of these, um, everything you need to know, it'll grow in nutrient poor soil. Most of our natives don't need um, any fertilizer. So just to add that to the point by growing and selecting the natives, we can have plants that aren't going to need the fertilizer and we don't have to worry about the fertilizer rules so much. Seaside goldenrod. This is a plant, uh, again, you're gonna get some of these uh, Santa and it, I think it looks like you planted some of this. Um, Connect to Protect, Jennifer Posley donated about 50 of these to us because they, when they received the seed for uh, Solidago, they had ordered the one for Pine Rockland and when they grew it out, they realized it was the seaside goldenrod 
and they can't use that in, in pine rocklands. This is a purported to be a favorite nectar plant of monarchs. Here you can see one of our um, buckeye butterflies on it. I'm not sure which one. And all of the photos will be attributed and some of them have further leak, um, links. So this plant, it'll grow and spread. And what you wanna do is deadhead it after it, after it goes to seed and it'll usually just keep expanding the clump and produce more flowers like this. That's your beach seam. That's your buffer. So I'm going to just kind of walk you through a little quicker on these. You're going to get the, um, the PDF. This is another interesting plant. All of the, um, the berries there are going to attract wildlife. Now this one, this is a terrible looking plant. It's got all these thorns on it. And it's got these seed pods, which might be a little interesting. And it kind of grows kind of wild and gnarly, like a vine, you know, like Bougainvillea, how out of control that can get. So why am I suggesting this as a plant you might consider planting, if you could even find it? Because it is the preferred larval host of the Miami Blue butterfly. While we're saving Blue Bay, the Miami Blue butterfly used to reside all up the coastline to about the Fort Pierce area, if you drew a line across that, in the state of Florida, and now is only found in two locations in the Keys. So that coastal butterfly disappeared when we started developing and taking out these natives and coming in with our, maybe our more refined, uh, landscape plants that we like because they have big flowers or we like the leaf structure but aren't from here and aren't as adapted and they don't provide anything for our, for our wildlife. So I would find a place for this, maybe even grow it along a fence line. Love, love, love if we can get this started and we'll start it up at a park. Crandon Park would be the first place this plant would go because we have now expanded the pollinator garden there and the concessionaire is making a butterfly garden as well. And we have Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Nature Center there. So we've got a good um, foot foothold on natural areas attracting and providing for wildlife there. Miami Blue, this link right here will take you to a spectacular six minute video or Vimo, and you'll feel like you took, um, you escaped to the Keys. And it features researcher Sarah Cabrera Steele. Excuse me. <coughs> As she's conducting research, you'll learn all of the ins and outs of what's being done from the McGuire Center, uh, Dr. Daniel's lab at uh, UF up in Gainesville. I did not get to go and visit the lab when I was up there for the Water Institute Symposium. So that tells you I need to make another trip. But plenty of information, just like we brought the Atala back from the brink of extinction, efforts are underway to try to bring this the Miami Blue. We have three other endangered butterflies that are just about to blink out, no longer being found here. And, and it's a lot, it's a full, full assault on this. Everybody, a big awareness campaign. And it's a beach plant and we're talking about protecting the bay. So let's get the habitat in we need for all of this wildlife. So I'm almost finished here. And I scared Sandy Shapiro yesterday. She goes, what is that iceberg? And I'm like, well, we, we can't go through this without looking at what is driving some of these problems that we're experiencing. Yes, we know that uh, nutrients fertilizing and overuse of water and hard surfaces creating storm water runoff and areas where we have uh, breaks in sewage lines and we have septic systems 
But the other driver behind this was the temperature. And that is global warming. And sea level rise is global warming. So, and just on, I think it was Thursday, the day before yesterday, I get a publication in my inbox every day. It has, it's information about coastal areas. And it had a link about hurricanes. And when I followed that, it talked more about the Antarctic and the rivers of warm air. So I just followed that again down the rabbit hole and found the, the website that just documents all of the data. And it is going into summer in the Antarctic now. So how warm will it get? Because we already know what projected sea level rise is, we have from NOAA, from worst case to, to moderate, and everyone's using a target date of 2050. Bye, I won't be here unless I live to be over 100. But we're, and we're starting to look at what happens if the Greenland ice shelf melts, that whole sheet of ice there. And you're, you'll start to hear that that's 20 feet of sea level rise. But what we're not looking at is if we lose the whole Antarctic ice sheet, that's 200 feet. And that would be like Kevin Costner in Waterworld. And I'm not saying that this is what's going to happen, but this is what we need to be looking at. And we know that in certain situations that things have accelerated with the melting of, of the Arctic ice and what is happening at Greenland now. So we need to make some fundamental changes, some shifts, if we're going to pull us back and leave something for all of our children and the rest of the living things on this planet. So yeah, that's the car I want. That's my little um, electric powered car, which I would like to recharge from a solar panel in my backyard. So here's our contact information. And I must also tell you that Laura and Jesus and will soon be back to a fourth team member. We're funded by Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department and by Department of Environmental Resource Management, oh, a whole list of, of other departments where all of this matters, where what you do outside plays such an important part of the health of our environment. We'll soon have a fourth person. Laura and Jesus do the irrigation assessments. So please, if you're using your sprinklers, if you have an irrigation system and you're using it, contact Laura or Jesus or come to our website and learn more about this program. Those are our social media links. And in all of my email correspondence, I have all of this hyperlinked. If you're going to use irrigation, let's make sure you're using it efficiently and you don't have any runoff situations and you're creating a healthy landscape. Coming up in the series, I'm going to cover, this is seagrass. We can have a green lawn and green seagrass. Yes, we can have both. So this is on the planning board. Uh, the Friday before last, when we were sort of hunkering down for, for Etta, I went to, okay, what's next after the buffer zone? Where do we want to take this? And what have I had access to? Um, I will tell you that Martin County did an incredible series over and is still going to ongoing, we'll start up again soon, called Water Ambassadors. And everything that was presented in that series that happened once a week is relevant to what is happening here in Miami-Dade County. We, the good news is that we haven't paid attention to this. I mean, the bad news is we haven't paid attention, but the good news can be that there are plenty of resources out there that we can look to. We can pick what worked and what hasn't worked. And you guys can all start from your backyard. So I'm done. Did I finish on time? Questions? <laughs> oh, one minute over. <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. What great. Hey. <laughs> hey, I can't do it, right? <laughs> Let me stop screen share and we'll have all of our faces and any questions, anybody? Thank you, Linda.
Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question or put it in the chat. Thanks, Barbara. That's all right. It's been, been fantastic. I really appreciate you sharing all of this with us, um, all of our garden friends. Um, we're also going to send out a survey for everyone, and hopefully some of those other um, planned programs you, we can add to our profile, um, invite our audience to as well. It's unbelievably so informative. Right. So, so one thing you, you can't do is, I. If I made a presentation that listed all of the plants, we could be here for days <laughs> and then you would forget what you heard already. But what I've done here, what Extension does, does is we share the resources where you can find the information. So you can learn this. How do you think I know about these plants? Well, first of all, I love them. So I'm going to start looking at them and learning about them. But having that information allows you to take it to the next step. So you've got a homework assignment, okay? You know? <laughs> there is a question on the chat from Eric. Sure. Other ground covers um, to use instead of St. Augustine. Um, off the bat, I love Sunshine Mimosa or Creeping Charlie, which is Phyla nodiflora. And yep. Barbara has any other uh, suggestions? I'll put well, the- Well, actually, you just yeah. hit on my two most favorite. And was that Eric Lemez that asked you that question? Because he's, he's in a lot of our presentations. And Eric, I know you sat through the uh, series on pollinators where I highlighted both of those plants. Um, and you can walk on, I wouldn't walk on my sunshine mimosa uh, because it's just too dear to me when it has those purple flowers. But you can walk over Phyla nordiflora and you can also, I like creating little stepping stone footpaths. I mean, I'm the, you know, I don't need that big expanse of, of green. I'm, I'm not grazing uh, livestock here. And when my youngest was really small, I used to watch him play this game where the landscape features and the ground covers were his islands. And he would like pretend he was on a boat going across the little rivers of grassy areas. Think about creating like a Fairchild or a Miami Beach Botanical Garden setting in your landscape and not just have that whole huge expanse of grass. We have publications all over our website, Electronic Data Information uh, System. I'm happy to share that with you. And in the series coming up is going to be uh, a workshop on how to convert your typical landscape into uh, a Florida friendly landscape. And you don't do it all at once, you keep adding. I'm gonna go out there and play with my sunshine mimosa later today, Santa. And then there's another question from Tim, who's one of our wonderful volunteers. Um, any plants for our dock on the canal that are iguana proof? Um, in my experience, the green creeper, which was first on Barbara's list, is iguana proof and is really wonderful. Golden rod, also, well actually iguana is like golden rod now that I think about it. Um, Barbara, any that come off the top of your head? No, uh, and I, I like, I didn't know that about the, um, the creeper, the beach creeper. And we have a publication on iguana and almost every uh, presentation that I do to a garden club or or um, organization like yours, ask me about iguanas. And fortunately, I don't have iguanas anymore living here in, in Redland because I think I have Burmese pythons um, <laughs> instead. But um, when you, what you can do, iguanas will lay their eggs and then once they are finished laying their eggs, they don't stay like an alligator would stay and guard the nest. So if you notice where they're laying their eggs, and, and I have observed this in the past, and I've had people call me about it, then you could go back and remove the eggs. And we, people talk about that in trying to control Muscovy ducks as well, because they just kind of get out of control. There's no natural predator for either of them, unless we have some gators. Um, 
And um, what happens with the Muscovy ducks, unfortunately, is they'll just be prompted to lay more eggs. Not sure if the iguanas would do that, but you can trap them. I will be happy to share that publication with you. And because you're not allowed to inhumanely kill any living thing. Well, I guess people do it with plants, but, but, but um, fauna, flora, I guess people can dispose of, but it, you know, it's a state statute that all wildlife, regardless of exotic or native is, must be, you know, you're not allowed to do anything with wild native wildlife, but non-native exotic pests, you have to um, be careful how you handle them. And there are ways to, to do that. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know. And I, I should know because I just read that publication again before I shared it with um, Coral Pines Garden Club last month. So I'll, I'll be happy to share it again. And on our extension website, we have, um, when you go to the menu area, when you go to pest, you can find publications on, on different pathogens, insects that are becoming pest, and critters that are pest. And we certainly have it on the electronic data information system. Happy to help you guys um, send you the link so you don't have to go searching for it. And, make sure that you're dialing it into Miami-Dade County conditions when you're looking for at this data. And I should add, when I previously mentioned the Collins Canal expansion that the garden just went through, um, we have iguanas up and down, not as many as we did before, but um, Tim, you can see it on Monday that most of those plants have not gotten chomped and 95% of them are native. Um, so also like muli grass, bakahatchee grass, those ones are great. Interesting. The iguanas don't like them, but um, yeah, there's plenty. Santa, I think you should do your own study, your own research on this. <laughs> Maybe. And you know, observation is the basis of all science and it, it just evolves around making notes and documenting what you're seeing. Yeah. So share that with us one day Keep watching it maybe they moved off from the construction we do know that when we when we have a cold front which i can't remember when we had our last cold front um they will they're reptiles and so uh, they can't regulate their body heat and they'll literally fall from the trees and we've had people who will pick them up and bring them in their car and then they come too as soon as they get warm inside the car and it's a little scary but um you know deep freeze might be part of the solution i always heard iguanas didn't like things variegated or furry fuzzy leaves that have fuzz on them hmm. texture and i don't know i think it might be a matter of taste jesse jerko told me that yeah, yeah. And you know, they all need a water source. So yeah, if you live near a canal, and probably this reason I don't see them where I live in Redland is, and or at the extension office, is we're not that close to water. We do have variegated hibiscus in the garden, and they miraculously do not touch that. And yeah, well, that's that is cool. Yeah. yeah. And they ate all the other ones that were really, really pretty. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I seriously think you guys need to do a, some documenting on this. I'm going to figure out who I need to notify that you're, you're finding this. And <laughs> let's do a study. Iguana proof, because you know, so many people, and I don't know if you guys ever knew Chris Rollins. He was the, the manager, and I call him the curator of the Fruit and Spice Park. He was there for almost 40 years. And is responsible for adding those incredible collections of tropical and subtropical fruit. He moved up uh, like West Virginia. And you know what he's having a huge problem with? Deer. Every time I talk to him, it's the deer. You can put up a 12 foot fence and they seem to be <laughs> able to jump that. So it's like, no matter where you go, for us, iguanas uh, can be a problem. But one of the other things that I'm a little um, 
I'm nervous about is the redheaded African anole um, or anole. And it's the one where the male gets the red orange head and they can get to be about 12, about 12 inches to 14 inches. Um, the females of course are, are less colorful and smaller, but I have seen them run for a white peacock butterfly not catch it because all of a sudden it noticed I was watching it and I was about five feet away. And then I have seen butterflies with the, the same, you know, bite mark from the jaw. And I have uh, other friends that are in natural areas, NAM, that have noticed the same thing. But one of the things is that, um, that their population seems to, it, it seems explosive when you first get, have them find you, your property but it seems to level off so it doesn't keep increasing at that same rate but it's still worrisome because once you get them they're going to increase and they're spreading more and more and of course they were released from captivity um, from people who bought these you know interesting critters at, um, at home and at, at a pet store and then got tired of taking care of them so when we put something out of its niche that's when we create these problems that can have ripple effects. So anything else, guys, you can, you know, um, I'm sure you contact Miami Beach Botanical Garden, which I call the jewel in the mist of Miami Beach. And I love these guys. Um, I mean, really, when we started doing the rain barrel workshops, it was Miami Beach Botanical Garden and Daring Estate. So it was regular every other month, one or the other. I have to thank them. I think my first presentation that I ever did when I was so nervous talking to the public was at Miami Beach Botanical Garden. Um, and you guys are just lovely to work with and do a great job with, with your efforts there. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, so. Barbara. Thank yeah, you for sharing so you're much. You're one of my my places that I tell everyone you must visit. So, yeah. Well, I appreciate that. We really have been, and we've through this whole seven months, we've been, you know, working really hard and making sure the garden is as exquisite as ever. With the help of a very strong team and a lot of wonderful volunteers. Thank you, Tim, and um, and we've really stayed with it. Uh, we have a lot going on come moving forward. Uh, with activities and outdoor safe activities for music and um, and art installations are coming where you can wa walk through the garden. So we want everyone to stay tuned to what we're doing environmentally, sustainable, sustainable um, efforts, as well as reasons to just come out and see us in the garden. Yes, and it and it will get better, everyone. We we kind of see a light. It's a little ways in the distance, but um, there is hope with a vaccine and just, hey, you guys didn't know that I made this mask. Of course, my mask would have a butterfly. <laughs> so okay. stay safe. It's going to get better. We'll get through this. And that garden is just getting more and more beautiful every day. So as soon as you can, we're going to be there. So all and right. we get those plants, we'll let everyone know and we'll begin the, the plant giveaway and show everyone what we're doing in the nursery. And, right. and, you know, everyone, we can always time it to make sure people feel comfortable. And, uh, and this week we're getting ready for Give Miami Day. That was my plug. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Um, and, and I will say that when Santa gets those seaside golden rods, um, she has a huge green thumb. She's going to grow those out and she's going to end up, I'm going to give her, I think it's about a dozen plants. I'm pretty sure that she'll have 40 plants in the blink of an eye because she's going to grow these out. They'll be her mother plants. Keep collecting the seed, keep replanting. And, you know, then you'll have a beautiful plant for all of these situations where we can protect the bay um, and it'll provide for butterflies. Just gorgeous plant fragrant. Um, you guys will love it. So thank you everyone for tuning in, for giving us your Saturday morning.
Thank you, everyone. We'll be in touch with the plan giveaway and any other resources that we went over today. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Hope you have a great weekend. Bye. Spend the rest of the day in the garden. Bye. Bye.